How many of you had trouble getting here this morning for some reason or another? Anybody? Something happened that just delayed you or tried to keep you from getting here? Or did you have a fight with someone on the way? Or not an actual fight, but a disagreement? <laughs> Nothing? Okay, good, good. That's really good because that's not normally the case when we're going to talk about spiritual warfare. And uh, that's what I want to talk about this morning. Uh, years ago, the girls were in, they were at Liberty University playing soccer. And because the games were usually on Saturday, or often on Saturday, and because I was a pastor, we only got to see one or two games their whole career, playing all the way through Liberty, and it just, it was a bummer. And um, I didn't have Matt around then, so, uh, matter of fact, he wasn't even thought of yet, Matt. Sorry about that, man. Uh, so I didn't have him. And so because of that, I had to get back on Sunday, and so we didn't get to see many games. But one Saturday, we, Saturday we'd gone over, we'd seen a game, we're traveling home, it's late at night, and Kathy and I are listening on cassette tapes, oh This Present Darkness by Frank Peretti. Mm -hmm. yes. It's dark, it's foggy, <laughs> and we're on the double A highway that goes through southern Ohio and Kentucky, northern Kentucky and southern Ohio. Have you ever been on that highway? It, it's a nice highway, but it's mostly abandoned. There's not much on it at all. And we're traveling at night, listening to this present darkness that talks about demons and the fight that's going on in the spiritual realm that people can't see. And, and like your skin is crawling. And we come up over this rise and we see this weird bunch of lights in the distance. And as we get closer and closer, there are like helicopters hovering overhead in this foggy dark in the middle of nowhere in the hills of, uh, of that territory. And all of a sudden, all the traffic stops. And these hovering lights are going around. And I mean to tell you, it like freaked us out. <laughs> Do you understand that the enemy is real? We actually fight against an active enemy. And, and if you want proof of it, I see it in your prayer requests each week as you sit, turn in Highlight Challenge. And I see the attacks of the evil one that is trying to distract you. They're, they're moving you off track. They're causing you fear and concern and trouble. It, it's the active attack of the enemy. Do we understand that we have an active enemy? 1 Peter 3, 8 says, Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around looking for someone to, de to devour. Now, I just took out that lion thing here because here's what I've noticed. When we begin to talk about spiritual war warfare, we spend too much time thinking about the metaphor, the, the lion, for instance, and not enough time about what's actually being said about spiritual warfare. And I'm going to do that today as we walk through this text. I'm going to take a different tack than you've ever heard uh, on this subject. How many times through the years people are ready to go to marriage retreat or family camp and all of a sudden all chaos breaks loose? Have you ever had that kind of experience? Cars break down. Trouble happens. You get late. You can't get off on time. You're driving and there's a traffic jam. Whatever happens, all kinds of stuff trying to keep you from getting to the marriage retreat or the family camp or anything like that. It's a, it is the evidence of spiritual warfare. Fights you have with your spouse. Do you understand they aren't with your spouse? The person you can't get along with at work, it's not that person. The thoughts that enter your head suddenly and all of a sudden you're panicking or fear. In the middle of the night you wake up and all of a sudden you're panicking about something that the next morning is going to seem so completely insignificant that you're almost embarrassed, embarrassed that I kept you awake. You all ever been there? I've been there. <coughs> Circumstances that suddenly go out of control and don't make any sense. Distractions 
that come along one after another that keep you from focusing on the Lord. By the way, if you want an illustration of spiritual warfare, all you have to say is COVID. See, we think that is a biological warfare. No, that's spiritual warfare. Biology is just the, the, it's, it's just the symptom of the spiritual warfare that's going on right now. And by the way, people are allowing that to take them completely off track, away from the Lord, into a, 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 into a context of fear. And I have never seen so much fear over anything since I've been a pastor. And by the way, I understand that me saying that makes some of you angry. And I'm too old to play church. I'm just telling it straight. It's just the truth. There, the fear that I've watched, I'm not talking about being careful. I'm talking about genuine, deep fear. And it's not okay for those of us who are in Christ. Fear is a lack of faith. Worry and fear are sin. Oh, pastor, you can't say that. Really? Because 365 times in the Bible, the command is given, fear not. So if the Bible commands you not to fear and you fear, what is that if it's not sin? I know we don't talk about sin in our culture today. We do here. Because sin is active in our lives, and we are to overcome the things of this world. I want to, I want to start with some basis of what we're going to talk about. First of all, Satan is a created being. You get that? He is not the creator. Satan and God are not locked in this cosmic battle, and we're not sure yet how it's going to come out. God created Satan created him as the beautiful angel who rebelled against God and God kicked him out. And that is what's going on. He is a created being. Secondly, Satan is real and his power is real. Thirdly, Satan commands a horde of demons. Those are biblical facts. Do you realize that in our Western modern culture, we read the Bible almost blind at the spiritual warfare that's on page after page after page. We ignore it. We skip over it. We kind of don't pay attention to it. But it's very real. And, and we need to be aware of it. Destroying you is the enemy's purpose. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That's what he does. Jesus said he is the father of lies. And he lies to you every time he opens his mouth. Now whether or not Satan himself actually bothers with me, I'm such a peon in the, in the, in the overall rank of things, but, but his demons and his emissaries are attacking me and lying to me constantly, just like they are to you. Years ago, I preached a message, and the title of the message was, The Only Lie in the Bible. And here is the passage that I preached on, 2 Corinthians 2.11. So that we not be, might not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. And I said, I think that might be the only lie in the Bible. Because most Christians are completely and utterly ignorant of his schemes. We don't need to be. But many, many Christians are. And so today, the objective is to get information to you. To get God's word to you. So that you can use that in spiritual battles. And uh, I know that it will make a difference. So... First of all, how do we recognize we're in a spiritual battle? This is something that's really cool. Listen, listen. This is worth the price of admission today. Did, did you pay it again? This is worth the price of admission today. And that's this. 
Satan always, ultimately, overplays his hand. See, what happens is you start with this subtle little distraction. And, and once that begins to work a little bit on you, then he'll hit you with something else, and something else, and something else. And it's like piling on until it gets so ridiculously obvious that you have to be spiritually blind not to see you're under an attack. You follow what I'm saying? So if you'll pay attention, you will recognize, oh, I know what's going on here. I see what this is. All right. You're not going to win this one. I know what to do. So that's the second question. How do we know what to do to win spiritual battles? How do we recognize them? How do we know what to do? That's what I want to talk to us about. And that's what Paul addressed in Ephesians chapter 6. Matt did an incredible job last week of setting the context of um, the spiritual protection we have when we're in Christ. And so let's read this passage together. Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. Now be patient. Focus as we go through this scripture. A final word. Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against the evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then, after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, Hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And pray for me too. Ask God to give me the right words so that I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan that the good news is for the Jews and Gentiles alike. I'm in chains now, still preaching this message as God's ambassador. So pray that I will keep on speaking boldly for Him, as I should. Now when we read this passage, we immediately focus on the metaphors. So let me share with you what typically gets done with this passage. Right here, this picture. No, wait, you're not Joe. <laughs> the, uh, did I put it out of order? Yeah, that great, great. You see that? Do you understand how that is utterly not helpful? Okay, now we have a Roman soldier who has a sword and a shield and a helmet and a breastplate and a belt and sandals. Wow! Now I know what to do. <laughs> do you understand? That's what we always do when we look at this. We go, okay, got a picture. Alright, shield. So what we focus on is the helmet and the sword and the shield and the breastplate and the belt and the shoes and miss what the actual tools are. Do you do understand? That if you dressed like that, you wouldn't be in any way protected against the attack of the enemy. Now, I don't make fun of that because Paul used the illustrations. What I'm saying is, we've been focusing on the metaphor instead of on the tools. The actual tools that give us victory in spiritual battle. So that's the end of this in my talk. And I want us to talk about the tools that we have. But before we do... I want to tell you about my favorite book of the Bible. My man, Job. I can say that because that's exactly what God said about him. Have you considered my man, Job? 
Let me read this passage. Spiritual attack, that's the context of what we're talking about. One day, the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord, and the accuser, Satan, came with them. Now, you need to understand, there is no way I will tolerate anyone trying to tell me this is a metaphor, or this is made up, or that this didn't actually happen to a literal character named Job who lived about the same time as Abraham and Melchizedek. Matter of fact, one day I think we might find out that Melchizedek and Abraham and Job knew each other. That's a pretty cool thought. So we're talking 2000 BC, you getting that? That's a pretty cool thing. I think that's when it was. I can tell you why it doesn't matter right now, but, but just hang in here with me. Um, so here we are in the heavenly court, and God has the angels coming before him. The principalities and powers and spiritual realm, you follow, is happening in heaven, a literal thing that's happening, and Satan is allowed in. Why does God allow him in? I don't know. I'm not God. You have to ask him that. But here is Satan. Where have you come from? The Lord asked Satan. Satan answered the Lord, I have been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. It's pretty scary, isn't it? Then the Lord asked Satan, Have you noticed my servant Job? He is the finest man in all the earth. He is blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God and stays away from evil. Satan replied to the Lord, Yes, but Job has good reason to fear God. You have always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his property. You have made him prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is. But reach out and take away everything he has, and he will surely curse you to his face, to your face. All right then, you may test him, the Lord said to Satan. Do whatever you want with him and everything he possesses, but don't harm him physically. So Satan left the Lord's presence. Do you recognize how real that is? And by the way, did you notice that God actually painted a bullseye on his man Job? God directed Satan's attention to Job. Lord, why would you do that? Because Job needs to be tested. And I'm going to test him. And Satan's going to attack him. And I'm going to prove to him that I am I am. You getting this? Now I want you to take just a minute. Step back. There was a day when the heavenly company came before the Lord. And Satan came there too. And he said, what you been doing? God asked. Oh, I've been checking out what's going on in America. Have you considered my man Alex? You understand? Have you considered my man Dusty? Have you considered my daughter Angela? You getting this? Sometimes God paints a target on you and lets Satan attack you. Lord, why would you do that? Because what Satan meant for evil, I mean for good. I want to prove to you how strong your faith is. I want to prove to you that I am who I am, that I can control and protect and guard you and walk with you, and you're going to come out of the other side of this stronger in your faith, more established, more, more solid than you have ever been. It is for your good, because I'm here for you, and I will protect you, and I will guide you, and I will walk with you through this test. Absolutely, that's happened. Something very similar like to that. And it's when we are in those major attacks. Matt alluded to this last week, but in Luke 22, 31, Jesus said, Simon, Simon, that's Peter, Satan has asked to sift each of you 
like wheat. But I have pray, pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. I want you to know, the enemy is still the accuser of Christians. And Jesus is still interceding for you on behalf of you, that your faith will not fail. Does that encourage you, or does that discourage you? It should encourage you. By the way, if God allows a particular attack, what does that say about you? That God knows you can take it. He knows you've got this. He knows that in Him you can do whatever you have to do, whatever you have to face. So let's talk about how do we defeat the enemy. The first one is, how do we recognize it? It's come in all different ways. Satan overplays his hand. You will notice that you're going from relative peace to extreme anxiety or chaos or whatever in a very short period of time. By the way, how think about Job from the first day to the second day. The day before the disaster to the day of the disaster. He went from everything's going good, he's got everything under control. Matter of fact, he had convinced himself most probably that he had everything in control. And all of a sudden, he's completely out of control and all chaos breaks loose. He loses all of his property, but I believe he didn't care a flip about that because he lost all of his kids, all of his in-laws, all of his sons and daughters and their spouses, and all of his grandkids. I want you to think about that because they were having a party. The, the oldest brother is what it says. And that happened in one day. And he went from on top of the world to everything was a disaster. Can you put yourself in Job's position? That's a pretty dramatic spot to be in, isn't it? Why? Because God had good planned for him. And we think, wow, Lord, if that is good, I'll pass. <laughs> God says, yeah, but you'll never grow to be who you need to be if you don't let me test you. And by the way, I'm going to test you whether you like it or not. Here's the issue. Will you pass the test or will you decide to fail the test? Do you understand that if you fail a test, you have to take the course over again? Don't fail the test. Know that if you're facing the trial, you can pass it or God wouldn't allow it. Put that in your head and, and hang on to that in your heart. So how to defeat the enemy? First of all, we use spiritual weapons. Look at this, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4. We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. Do you understand? That's, what we, that's our opt-in. That's our default, is to wage spiritual battle using human power. And we fail every time. So we don't wage war as humans. We use God's mighty, mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to <laughs> knock down the strongholds of human re reasoning and to destroy false arguments. So we are to use the spiritual weapons that God has given us. And that's where we come to the, to the pictures um, of, of the um, breastplate and the belt and all that stuff. And we get all distracted with that and we miss what the real tools are. So here are the tools. First of all, the first weapon we have is truth. Do you understand that I am telling you the truth today about spiritual warfare? Where did I get that information? Did I make it up in a book? No, that's the ones that, that's what they're doing that deny that we're in a spiritual battle. That we're too sophisticated to believe in the, you know, bad guys behind the corner that are demons. And, you know, anyone who believes in demons are obviously not very smart. Jesus believed in dead demons. So I'm in good company. So, first of all, we have truth. Are you living your life according to the actual truth of God's Word. Are you? What is your truth source? Is it your feelings? 
Many, many people today are using their feelings as a truth source. Is it your intellect? Is that what you're using as a truth source? And let me show you an example of how that works. If, if you allow your mind to overrule what God has said, you are using your mind, your thinking, as your truth source. You have just trumped God's word. You follow? That's not okay. What does God say? That's the only question. That is, that is the question. 1 John 4, 4 says, But you belong to God, my dear children, and you have already won a victory over those people because, here's the truth, the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. The enemy cannot defeat the power of God. Unless you let him. That God in you, the Holy Spirit of God, is greater than the spirit of the enemy who is in the world. Second, second tool we have is righteousness. By the way, if it is not your heart desire to live righteously, you're probably not going to do very well in the spiritual battle. You're either going to cave to the temptation, you're going to run away in fear, you're going to quit. You're going to hunker down. You're going to get defeated if you don't have the desire to live righteously. I believe that's one of the great evidences of whether or not someone has truly uh, become right with God through faith in Jesus Christ is that they have a, it is the driving passion of their heart to obey God. They may not always do it. They might mess up. Matter of fact, you will mess up every day to some extent. But if it's not the actual desire of your heart to live righteously, I don't believe you're saved. Now, I don't get to decide that. God gets to decide that. But I'm saying that has to be part of the evidence of whether or not you have had an encounter with God is do you desire to live righteously? 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yes, and everyone who wants to live godly, a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So, if you want to live righteously, then the attacks come along. Now, here's why that is. A person who claims to be a Christian, but is completely ignoring God except giving him a nod once in a while and just living on through life, the enemy leaves that person alone. He, whatever he does, he doesn't want to mess up. The, the lack of faith this person is living by, do you follow? I, he's, in effect, he claims to be a Christian, but he's one of mine. So I'm going to leave him alone, or her alone, because uh, they're not doing anything for the kingdom. They're not doing anything to try to live righteously. But as soon as you engage, by the way, how many times have we seen when someone determined to engage the Great Commission in obedience, that first of all, spiritual warfare goes through the roof. Because you've been sitting on the bench, and now you're going to get in the game, and they do not want you in the game. So they're going to throw a hissy fit trying to keep you from actually obeying what God wants you to do. That's the way it works. That's how you recognize it. it's a spiritual attack. That should make us smile. Oh, this is cool. This means I have the potential of seeing some great things happen or the enemy wouldn't be throwing such a fit. It's pretty cool if you think of it that way. Righteousness. The third is the gospel of peace. Do you know how the gospel brings you peace? I'm not talking about peace in your soul. I'm talking about peace with God. Romans 5.1 says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That means, by the way, that you were once an enemy of God. You can say, oh, pastor, I was never God's enemy. I'm sorry, the scripture says that until you were saved, you were God's enemy. You were at enmity with God. But now you're one of his. And you have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the fact that you know that that gospel brings you strength in a spiritual attack. Because here's what's true. If you don't know the Lord, you're on your own in a spiritual battle. Your 
like the man that was possessed by the legion of demons who was completely out of control. You may not be. That's the extreme case. You follow? But somewhere along there, because you don't have the power to have victory if you don't have the Holy Spirit living in you if you're not saved. Next one. Faith. This question has been so important in my life. Do you really trust God or do you just say you trust Him? Do you understand how faith keeps the enemy's attack from actually drawing blood? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For we walk by faith, not by sight. That's why you can walk with confidence in the middle of a spiritual attack, even though chaos is going all around you because of your faith. You are walking by faith and not by sight. And then salvation. You understand how salvation keeps you strong when attacked by the enemy. Romans 8.18 says, Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory which will he will reveal to us later. Let me give you an illustration of how this works. I am a big Formula One fan. I know that makes me a geek or something. I don't know. It's all right. But I, um, I, I, you know, I just love Formula One. I'm paying attention to it all the time. I tape it on Sunday morning because all the races, almost all the races happen while we're worshiping. So I tape, you know, I DVR it or whatever you call that and uh, record it and watch, the, watch it later. So this afternoon, I will watch the Turkish Grand Prix. When I, I got to watch a few minutes of it this morning, Hamilton went from 11th to 5th. So he's on the charge. So we'll see what happens by the end of this race. There have been times on Sunday morning, I accidentally find out who won before I watch the race. And there have been a couple of times when I have watched, when I have found out, that my guy Hamilton, uh, Lewis Hamilton, won the race before I watch it. Do you know that takes all of the stress out of watching the race away? <laughs> It'd be like if you knew that the Colts won and then you watched the game, you wouldn't be stressed out that they were behind 21 to 7 because you know they're coming back. You know what I mean? That may be. It wouldn't stress you out at all. Listen, listen, are you getting this? Do I have to explain this to you or do you get this? I know who wins the battle. Amen. I've read the end of the book. I know that I win in the end. And therefore, no matter what the score looks like on the field of my life, I know who wins in the end. It makes all the difference in the world. And then the Word of God. Word of God. Do you know how to handle the Word of God when you're attacked? Do you have enough of God's Word in your mind that when the enemy attacks, the Word of God is there as the offensive weapon against him? Do you know how to correctly handle the Word of God? Or do you just pick out little verses once in a while and it's important that we study. That's what the scripture says. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. And then this one doesn't have a metaphor with it. In other words, it's not like the shin guards of prayer or something. You know, I don't know what else. To wear. No. But prayer is the other weapon we have. There are, there are really two offensive weapons. One is the, the Word of God, and the other is prayer. So the Word of God is how God talks to us. Prayer is when we talk to God. And if we would, at the moment of attack, turn to God and pray, instead of glaring at the enemy's attack, which we have a tendency to do, right? I mean, it's a lot of commotion he creates. Do you follow that? And so this commotion is going on, and you are completely focused on the commotion when we should be focused at our Lord. And that's, the, that's hard to do, right? 
Because there's this crazy battle going on here, and you're looking over here. That's what we need to do. Recognizing those spiritual attacks and getting our face toward the Lord in prayer and His Word. That's how we do it. Truth and righteousness and the gospel of peace and faith and salvation, knowing how it ends, God's Word and prayer. It's not real complicated. Nor is that equipment that gets all of our attention something that we haven't heard about before in the Word of God. But we have to use the tools that God has given us when we're in a spiritual battle. And our tendency is to so focus on the battle that we miss the tools that He's given us. So, Yehoshaphat. Yehoshaphat means Yahweh is judge. He was king in the mid 9th century BC. So around 850, 870 to 840 something, he was king. And uh, Ammon and Moab were attacking Jerusalem. Now here's a map to give you an idea. So Ammon and Moab would be in what is modern Jordan. You get the picture here? And they had come down here to En Gedi. And En Gedi, many of us have been there to, to En Gedi. It's, a, it's an oasis in the middle of the Dead Sea. That's where David hid from Saul in the cave and cut off the edge of his robe when, when uh, Saul went to the bathroom. Yeah, that's what happened. Anyway, they had gathered the armies of Moab and Ammon right there in En Gedi. And they were coming up this pass. It's the... It's the uh, pass of Ziz, it's called. You go right up this pass, heading right to Jerusalem to attack. And, of course, the children of Israel are terrified. And God tells, and, and Jehoshaphat goes immediately to the Lord in prayer and asks him for protection and for wisdom. And God encourages him. And here's what they learn. Verse 12. For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. I want you to recognize, and this is, a, this is a real battle that actually happened in history, but it has spiritual application for us. And so by application, I want to tell you, you are powerless against the attacks of the enemy. The enemy is stronger than you are in yourself. Ready? Ready? That is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. So Jehoshaphat is praying to the Lord and saying, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. There's the first thing you've got to know. Get your eyes on the Lord when you're being attacked. That next time, listen, listen, think about it. You're on your way home and your spouse says something to you, you hear it with a certain edge that tent, you're gonna, it's going to set you off. Right? He or she knows how to push your buttons. And they just push the button. Now come on, don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. And there's going to be an edge there. And that is a spiritual attack because you are not fighting against your wife or your husband. You are fighting against the enemies in the spiritual realm. If at that moment when you are annoyed and you're ready to pop off something smart aleck back and then that'll es escalate it and then pretty soon you'll be in an argument on the way home. You know what I'm talking about? Like you all have experienced that, right? Mm -hmm. Are you all too holy for that? <laughs> yeah. No? Kathy and I have done that many times. Usually about my driving. Is what that's about. <laughs> we don't argue about much, but... A lot of times it's in the car. <laughs> I told you before, I cannot put any witnessing thing on my car because I'm not a good enough witness when I'm driving. <laughs> I don't want to dishonor the Lord, so I don't have a cross or a Ichthus or, you know, follow me to Jesus kind of thing. Nothing. I found it, you know, nothing uh, on, the, on the, uh, the car. 
Anyway, and, but if at that moment, when you first start to get annoyed, what would happen if you would just turn your eyes to the Lord? I am powerless in this situation. I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. Now, listen as we go on. 2 Chronicles 20, verse 15. Thus says the Lord to you, Do not be afraid, and do not be dismayed at this great horde. For the battle is not yours, but God's. You hearing that? It's not your battle. It's the Lord's. And then he goes on in verse 17, and he says this, But you will not even need to fight. Take your positions, listen to this, and stand still and watch the Lord's victory. He is with you. What did we read in Ephesians 6, 10 through 12? Stand, 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 stand. Not fight, not run, not fear, not shrink back. Stand still. It's not your battle. It's the Lord. You don't know what to do? Fix your eyes on Him. It's not your battle. It's God's battle. You stand still and He will win the battle for you. Pretty cool thing, isn't it? So let me share, as we close, some important concepts. First of all, Satan is already defeated. Colossians 2.15, in this way he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Their fate is already sealed. They have already lost. We are already victorious. Secondly, the Holy Spirit is greater. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Thirdly, God has not given us a spirit of fear. It's why this fear thing has bothered me so much through this process. And by the way, when I mention to someone that they have fear, and they go, I do not! Oh, maybe so. <laughs> Methinks thou dost protest too much. <laughs> yeah, chill. Chill. Yeah. The scripture says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power and love, and self-discipline. Here's the thing we have to do. We're told this over and over again. Stand. Another way of saying it is in James 4, 7. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist. Stand still. Let God win the victory. Then pray for spiritual protection. The Lord's Prayer. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one is the way it's translated in the NLT. Protect me from the evil one. Don't let me yield to the temptation. Deliver me from the evil one. And then be reminded, 2 Thessalonians 3.3, 3, but the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. Do you understand? We already have victory. We just have to stand in the truth and righteousness and salvation and gospel and, and all that God has given us, the word of God and prayer, and we already are victorious. The issue is that the enemy catches us at weak times and throws us off track, and we wind up going down this deep ravine before we realize what happened because we're not aware, and we need to be aware. So what? Bottom line, will you stand and see the victory God has already won for you? One last image, another application. You know, we get, we know Elijah, and everybody thinks, you know, Elijah is the, the famous prophet. But actually, his successor, Elisha, did way more than Elijah did, at least from our vantage point. He did. And Elisha kept tipping the hand of the kings of Israel so that the king of Aram, which is Syria, kept losing in battles. 
And so Elisha is in Dothan. And I think I have it. Yeah, there, Dothan, you can see. So this king from Syria brought his troops to Dothan because they found out that Elisha was the one that was tipping off where the Syrians were going to attack and therefore the Israelites weren't there and they didn't have to fight them. And so the king of Syria is getting furious, so he's going to go kill this man of God by the name of Elisha. And so he surrounds his troops around Dothan. We've been right in that area, by the way. It's by Megiddo and Bethshan we've been. And Nazareth, you can kind of see where it is in Galilee. Ser Sam Samaria is where it would be today. And we read... One night the king of Aram sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city of Dothan. When the servant of the man of God got up early the next morning, he went outside. There were troops, horses, and chariots everywhere. Oh, sir, what will we do now, the young man cried to Elisha. Don't be afraid, Elisha told him, for there are more on our side than theirs. You know how many troops Elisha had? Zero. And he says, there's more on our side than theirs. Then Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. To understand that we have, he will give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. They will bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. We have the victory. Yes, the enemy has troops. The demons are many. And we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in the spiritual realm. But there are more on God's side than the enemy's side. Mm -hmm. He is a defeated foe. And 100% of the time we can defeat him if we will stand firm when we're attacked. With our eyes on the Lord, knowing that the battle belongs to the Lord, not you and me, and knowing that all we have to do is stand still and watch the Lord win the battle. That's encouraging, isn't it? That's what God has for us. Even today on our way home from this message, there's a good chance someone's going to get attacked. Just the way it is. And you will immediately have forgotten what we talked about. I know how that is. By the way, you want to test this sometime? Go out in the parking lot and say, what did Gary just talk about? And they'll go, um, oh, pastor, that was such a good message. Oh, really, what was it about? I don't do that to you because I know that's embarrassing, but you go, uh, Jesus? <laughs> no, you know, it's funny. I get it. I understand. But by the way, when you get attacked, what if we remember to get our eyes on the Lord? Stand firm, knowing the battle belongs to him that we've already won. All we have to do is resist the enemy, and he will flee. Let's do that this week, okay? Instead of letting that little argument escalate, instead of getting angry at your boss at work, instead of getting frustrated when you drive, or whatever it is that gets you down, whatever besets you, what if we just stood strong? in the faith, knowing God has given us the victory. Father, just help us to do that this week. Help us to remember, Lord, that when that thing happens, they're not the enemy. We have an active enemy who's trying to steal, kill, and destroy. But we also have the victory if we will stand firm in the faith, <coughs> using the righteousness and truth and the word of God and prayer and fixing our eyes on you and letting you give us the victory. Lord, if we'll do that, we will see amazing things happen. And we can walk away from those encounters encouraged in our faith, knowing 
This stuff we talk about in your word is not theoretical or philosophical, but absolute truth that works in our lives in an incredibly practical way. Lord, may we understand that and stand firm as you win the victory. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I love you guys. Have a great week.